Okay. <clears throat> Um, tonight's dialogue is uh, with Bruno Olshausen on new developments in neuroscience. Um, uh, check out the laser talks if you want the long bio. My introduction is notoriously uh, brief. He's professor of neuroscience at uh, optometry at UC Berkeley and the director of the Redwood Center for Theoretical uh, Neuroscience. I don't remember how many years you've been the director. But... Uh, 15, yeah. 15, okay. Um, he studied at Stanford and at Caltech. Okay, let's jump right into it. Bruno, can you give us an idea of what is visual perception? What are the challenges uh, of this? Uh... Sure. So I just thought I'd, maybe I'd begin with a few introductory remarks and uh, you know, not, not give a, a full talk and just open it up to questions right from, from you and others and have a discussion. But um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, if you speak just a little bit louder. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So let's see. I'll just uh, share um, uh, slides I made here. So just by way of uh, introduction, this is the, the group I work with at UC Berkeley in the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. And basically, uh, we're a group of uh, students, postdocs, and faculty. Uh, many with backgrounds in math, engineering, computer science, as well as neuroscience and vision science and psychology. And so what we're trying to do is uh, basically bring together ideas from these different fields uh, to try to understand how, uh, how the brain does information processing. So how, how neurons in the brain, how these networks of neurons process information, how we build representations of the world. So it's a highly interdisciplinary field of study it draws upon you know, all the mathematical and, uh, you know, physical sciences, as well as the biological sciences uh, and, uh, and engineering. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the work that, uh, uh, well, some of the big questions that we're trying to address in the lab uh, you know, relating to perception and, uh, and how the brain, uh, how the brain does perception. Uh, and, uh, most of these big questions we we don't know the answers to, uh, and uh, and I think what I want to sort of plant in your head is that um, a lot of times we don't even know what the right questions are to ask. Um, it's just such a deep and profound um, subject. Um, but what I want to do is maybe sort of get, give a give you a feeling of things we do know, and some of the big mysteries out there that we're trying that um, trying trying to address. Um, so so first of all, um, just to to kind of frame the problem of uh, perception, I thought I would just start with a demonstration. And uh, so uh, let's see, I'm not sure how to usually uh, with a group of people uh, in a live audience, it's easy to get some feedback about what people see here. But this is an image of something. Uh, and hopefully, uh, most of you have not seen this before. Um, and uh, but uh, but to most people, when they first look at this, uh, seeing they just sort of see uh, uh, kind of random splotches of black and white, sort of a grainy image of black and white splotches. Um, I don't know if it's possible to get feedback. Uh, let's see if I can um, maybe just raise your hand if, if, I, if, you just, if you don't see a figure, a clearly defined figure in here, if it's just sort of like two dimensional black and white splotches. I don't know if I can see the uh, hands that go up. No, I don't think I can. So, um, <laughs> well, anyways. Uh, so uh, hopefully to most of the most of you, this looks just kind of uh, um, more this here. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna do a quick shot. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Well, one person, don't say what you see. <laughs> All right. So uh, I say so. Uh, okay. So so uh, now for but before you see the figure in this uh, image, uh, when uh, when the, when one person with uh, one particular person uh, when they. Uh, we're asked to draw what they see. This is one way of interrogating, one way of interrogating your brain and what's inside, what you're seeing, uh, is by asking a subject to draw what they see, all right? So this is what one subject drew uh, when, when uh, they were asked to, to just draw what they see in this image here. And uh, what it is is just kind of a, a veridical representation of the black and white boundaries in the scene. Uh, so hopefully most of you would agree if you were asked to draw something, you draw something similar. Uh, maybe you might sort of fill in the black regions or something like that. It's just kind of a sort of, uh, you know, it's just a truthful representation of like the pixel values in the image. 
Okay, so now I'll, I'll tell you, uh, give you some hints about uh, what's, in the, what's, this, what's in this scene. Uh, there's an animal in here. And in particular, it's a cow. Um, and for a lot of people, that's enough to already see it. Uh, but it, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, hopefully you can see my mouse here. Uh, and uh, I'll just sort of draw the outline. So this is the outline of the face of the cow. Uh, and then there's an eye here. This is another eye over here. And the, and the snout um, is down here. And then the, maybe the body over here. Okay. So uh, hopefully that works for most of you. And now you see something completely different from this figure. Uh, and now the same person who drew this figure at the right, now uh, when, when asked to draw what they see, uh, this is what they draw. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, and the, the big question we have here is, uh, well, where did this come from? This image in A, right? This thing that the person sketched in A. Uh, where did this come from? So this over here in B, is pretty much the kind of representation we know you have in your retina. So in your retina, in your eye, there's a bunch of photoreceptors which signal how much light is coming in from a particular direction in space. And those are processed by, uh, by neurons called retinal ganglion cells, which uh, tend to signal uh, boundaries or edges in the image. Okay, so if you looked at how the retinal ganglion cells were firing, firing in response to this image here, you would see something like this, maybe sort of a representation of where the where the, uh, the, the black and white edges are in the scene. Um, okay, so this is just kind of a, again, just kind of a, a literal representation of the image data coming into your visual system. Uh, and so where'd this come from though? This is not in your retina, right? Your retinal representation looks nothing like this. And of course, so this came from somewhere inside your head, basically from the rest of your brain, um, and in particular, the back of your brain in the visual cortex. Uh, and so basically the, the point of this is to say that when, when we look out at the world, what we're experiencing in perception is not the image on our retina, right? If you could, exper if you could experience the image on your retina, you would be shocked and very disappointed actually. It's a very low quality kind of, you know, grainy image is highly unstable. We'll show some examples maybe later um, of that. Uh, but you're not, exper you're not experiencing the image on, on your retina, you're experiencing an interpretation of that image data. And in particular, what we're doing in our brains is we're building models of the world. And what we experience then is, are these models of the world that we're building internally from data, okay? But the data that it builds those models from looks nothing like the models, okay? Uh, and so these, these models are very rich. Uh, as you can see here, we're sort of pulling out all this three-dimensional structure about the, 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 the face, the head of the cow, uh, and you can interpret now different meaning, attribute different meanings to different parts of this image. For example, this part, this, this black white edge, you might attribute to the reflectance, you know, the black and white fur on the cow. Uh, whereas this edge here, you probably would attribute to a shading cue due to the three dimensional shape. So it's telling you something about how it, like there's an indentation in, in, the, in the head there where the nose is. Uh, and, and so this is more of a shading cue. There's a shadow being cast. Okay, so for example, you can attribute all now all these three dimensional causes or reflectance causes to different parts of the image, which you weren't doing here, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, not only could tell me this cow, you could tell me something about his pose, you know, where the body is. Uh, and, and moreover, you can notice all this graininess in the image. You would probably attribute this graininess to the photographic process, not to the cow itself, right? You so say that's that graininess is an, um, another layer that I'm viewing this thing through. Uh, and it's, it's not part of the cow. Okay, so the point is here is, is a very extremely rich, detailed uh, percept that you have this world uh, of, this, of this scene here that goes far beyond the data, okay? It goes way beyond the data. You're extrapolating far beyond the data to conjure up this, this, this model. For all practical purposes, it's, it's a hallucination, okay? And, and uh, most of our percepts of the world are hallucinations, and usually most of the time they're correct. Okay, there are, these hallucinations are tracking what's actually going on in the world out there, and, uh, and it works for us just fine. Okay, but for all practical purposes, they really are um, hallucinations. They're not, what, what we're not experiencing is a literal representation of the image on our retina. Um, okay, and, and the point is that, you know, the reason why we do this, the re reason why we build these models of the world is so we can interact with the world, right? If you want to reach out and grab that cow, you would know how to move your arms and your hands and shape them to do that. Okay, so you need to build these models of the world in order to be able to usefully 
uh, and meaningfully interact with the world. And finally, one thing I'll, I'll say about uh, perception, this, this is one thing that makes perception very difficult to study, is that this experience is highly subjective. Okay, it's very rich uh, and it, it's very private experience that just lives inside your head. And one way we can interrogate that is by you know, asking people to draw what they see, but it's a very sort of low bandwidth link to sort of get that information out of your head. Uh, or you could verbally describe what you see, but if you just said, okay, I see a cow and it's kind of looking at me, well, again, you know, that doesn't really do justice to the richness of what you're experiencing, all, all these sort of myriad details in this scene. Okay, so it's a very rich, high bandwidth representation that you have internally, uh, and uh, it's hard to sort of get that out in your uh, get out out of your head and operationalize this this problem this task of perception in a way that we can study in the laboratory objectively, right? And so this is part part of what makes it very challenging to study and get at scientifically. Okay, but this is really the phenomenon we're trying we're trying to get at. Okay, and so maybe you know going into that next, this next question of what we, you know where where did this where did this where did this uh, this percept of the shape of the cow come from? And I said, it comes from inside your head. Well, here's what inside your head looks like. Uh, this is just sort of a picture of the brain, looking at it from the, from the side. And the part of the brain that processes vision here is in the back, in the occipital lobe, okay, the cerebral cortex. And this is from a drawing of, uh, from uh, David Hubel in his book on vision. And I've sort of changed it now so the subject is looking at this picture of the cow, right? Uh, so you're getting all these pixels in your retina, uh, this sort of pixelated representation of, of the scene in your, in your retina. And it's sampled by a set of uh, retinal ganglion cells. And those retinal gang each of those retinal ganglion cells has an axon or a wire that goes out the back of the eye. So this, this, this nerve fiber that comes out of, the, out of the eye, we call it the optic nerve or optic tract. Um, it comes out the, uh, the back of the eye. And, uh, and there's about a million, uh, one million fibers in there, about, you know, about a million wires. So that's equivalent to believe about a one, one megapixel camera in terms of its resolution or sampling of the scene. Uh, these fibers then uh, innervate a nucleus here called the lateral geniculate nucleus, which people sometimes think of as a, as, a, as a relay nucleus, which is relaying information to the cortex. And then these fibers in turn then innervate uh, uh, the primary visual cortex back here. And then about 30 or 40 different uh, distinct different visual areas within the cerebral cortex here in the back, um, in the back of your brain. Okay. And this is the part that's involved in building these, these internal representations of the world, at least what, from what things we know so far. And this is largely a lot of this data we get from the, about the brain is by sticking microelectrodes or other recording devices. And this has advanced a lot, especially in the last decade or so, uh, by, by, by monitoring the activity of neurons in the brain as, uh, as a subject views, uh, views the world. And then looking at the relationship between these neural representations we see in the brain back here and then these, these external stimuli of what's, what's coming in from the, from the outside world. Okay, so just taking that a level deeper. Okay, so, so you know, the, the, what we, the, what I'm, the idea I'm sort of hypothesizing is that we build models of the world, right? So that this is the data coming in and sort of now you build some model of what's out there. Um, and maybe just talk a little bit about, just to kind of set, set the stage for discussion, I'll just say a few things now about the kind of what we know about the neural machinery that's, um, that's building these models. Uh, and so um, over uh, oh, you know, many decades, people have built up a, a wiring diagram of these different areas, okay? So you can sort of make a box diagram of these 30 or 40 or so different, um, different areas within the cerebral cortex, that, in the visual cortex here. And this is just showing you what that box diagram looks like and how all these boxes are interconnected. And this is done through neuroanatomical experiments where they inject uh, neurons with a dye in one area. And then they look at how that dye is transported down the axons and where it shows up in another area. Okay, so there's a lot of painstaking experiments that have gone into constructing this wiring diagram um, of these different areas. And in this particular way of drawing these, these, different, uh, these different areas within the visual cortex, uh, each of these boxes, the, the size of the boxes uh, is, is made so that it reflects how much surface area on the cortex is consumed by that, by that er area. And so these areas V1 and V2 are relatively low level visual areas that have a topographic representation of the retinal image. Okay, so it's like so representing some uh, feature date, features about the image like lines and image, um, uh, edges or surface boundaries within the image. People, people largely think of these 
as representing image properties. Okay, and they're fairly sort of they're in the rep, they represent the image uh, that's seen in image coordinates or in what's called the retinotopic coordinates. Uh, whereas these these higher level areas, as we ascend up to these blue blue boxes up here, these are in, in your temporal lobe. These neurons uh, now are, are are thought to be involved in object representations. Uh, so if you if you record from one of these neurons, you find that they're highly selective to particular objects and not others. So they're not so much just encoding pixels or features of the image, but more abstract properties about the world and the shapes of objects. I mean, the, these areas up here in kind of yellow or orange are more involved in uh, representing information about relative spatial relationships or motion and so forth. That's kind of complementary to this in the, these areas in blue. Okay, so rather than in representing information about objects per se, it's more about relationships and, 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 and between objects. It's thought to involve, help you with navigation or reaching motions and so forth in the scene. Uh, in addition to all this structure, then uh, finally, just, uh, <laughs> this is you know, getting at some of the big mysteries. All these areas, uh, and uh, well, let me mention, actually, just go back to this, 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 this picture here. Um, I, I, what I might have mentioned about all these interconnections is that they're all bi-directional. So there's a projection, you know, V1 does some processing on the image. And it sends that the results of that processing to this second area V2, and then V2 in turn, send, after it does its processing, sends its information back to V1, okay, and modifies these activities in some way. When, again, which we don't understand. But uh, one of the things I want to suggest is, you know, when we look at that image of the cow, and at first uh, you didn't see it as, as any kind of object, uh, what I would hypothesize is that as representation mainly lives here in terms of low-level features. And uh, that when you see the cow, that's the result of information percolating up here and some neurons acti appear activating, representing the three-dimensional shape of some object you know about. And then when that happens, these neurons feed back to these lower level areas and help to reinforce that activity and disambiguate these features and to come, at, uh, come up at a consistent representation. So, so I guess that's my own hypothesis. And I think you know, many other people I think agree with this too. There's something about this bi-directional flow of information uh, between areas. Um, you know, as, ascending and descending through these different pathways uh, that has to do with our ability to, um, to build models of the world. And, and the other thing I want to mention is that one way to think about this is that your representation of the world is really distributed across all these different boxes. Okay, if you want to know something about the fine details in the scene, that's probably down here. If you want to know something about what object it is, it's probably over here. And if you want to know how the cow's head is oriented and, you know, how you should reach out at it and so forth, then that's, you know, that's up here, okay? So that's sort of roughly, okay? But it's sort of distributed across all these different areas. Just, it doesn't live in any one of these boxes, right? No one of these boxes like is the seat of consciousness or the seat of visual, er seat of visual awareness. It's really distributed across all these, all these different boxes. Okay, so just going on. So, so all these areas are connected with the, uh, a nucleus in the thalamus called the pulpinar. Uh, again, with this bi-directional flow of information, what this is doing, is just a, I, I, it's a gigantic mystery box, okay? I think we could say it's very important <laughs> uh, because if you severed these connections, you'd probably be blind or you wouldn't be uh, you know, conscious visually. Uh, uh, but what all these boxes, uh, all these connections are doing with this nucleus system, the thalamus, I mean, it's thought to have something to do with attention, loosely speaking, but it's a huge mystery. And, and again, this is reflecting the fact of where, where V1 gets its information is from, is from the LGM, which I mentioned before, the lateral geniculate nucleus, which in turn, it gets its information from the, from the retina. And again, this projection from the LGN to V1 is bidirectional. So V1 has 10 times as many fibers that are going back here to, v, to the LGN and modifying the activity back down here. Okay, okay so, then, uh, so then diving a little deeper into it, if we look at the structure of V1, uh, what does that look like? Well, basically, it's a piece of cortex. And all of cortex is a two-dimensional sheet of neurons. It's about two millimeters thick. And then this sheet is highly enfolded on itself, so it can kind of fit inside your head. But topologically, it's really a two-dimensional sheet of neurons. Okay? And all the stuff in purple is what we call the gray matter. It shows up in purple here because it's a nissel stain. And the stuff in white is what we call white matter because it's just mainly the wires. It's just the wires or axons that interconnect these different parts of the gray matter here where the computation is happening. Now, if we take a cross section of one of these sections here, uh, we will see something like this. And there's about, uh, there's a layered structure here. And, uh, and the density is about uh, 100,000 neurons per square millimeter. 
And just to give you an idea, so that's one millimeter square on the side. So if we had another millimeter, uh, one millimeter linear dimension on, uh, on the side here, if we had another millimeter coming out of the screen, uh, then there'd be 100,000 neurons in there. Uh, so just give you, uh, you know, a, a way to sort of mentally imagine that, visualize that. Uh, this is what 100,000 is, right? That's because we toss around these numbers in neuroscience all the time. What do they mean? You know, so 100,000 neurons, that's like, you know, this is how many people would fit in the Rose Bowl Stadium um, when it's at capacity, okay? Uh, so, so each person is a neuron here, and this is how many neurons you have within one square millimeter of surface area cortex. Uh, uh, and, and just to give you an idea for, for, for the area V1, which is processing information from the retina, all these neurons are processing the equivalent of about a 14 by 14 pixel region within your, within your retina, okay? So a very, you know, relatively small number of pixels is coming in and being just, you know, chewed on by huge amounts of neurons and something amazing is happening here. And again, you know, why you need 100,000 uh, and what all these neurons are doing, um, mostly, uh, mostly big question mark, okay? And now if we take any one of these people on the scene, that's a neuron, what does a neuron look like? Well, a neuron has a cell body and it has all these processes. And this is what makes neurons uh, very distinct from other cells in your body is that they're highly, um, uh, highly structured in this way, that they have all these processes that extend out. And of course, these are used to signal and also to aggregate information. So what we're seeing here are mainly all the dendrites of a neuron. Uh, so they gather inputs from about, as, about 10, 1,000 to uh, about anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 inputs that are converging on the dendritic tree here uh, from other neurons. And then this neuron in turn has an axon coming out of it, which goes to other neurons. And then if we, uh, if we uh, zoom in on all that, what we would see is, you know, so here's a neuron, and then there's a neuron over here, a neuron here, they're all packed in a three-dimensional volume here. And so if we take a, a cross-section of that three-dimensional volume, this is what you would see in an EM electron microscope um, section. And this is just all these processes that are all kind of packed together, all the dendrites and axons of other neurons, blood vessels, glia, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the, the thing to sort of visualize here, it's not a nice and tidy circuit like you would see on a VLSI chip, like on a silicon chip, you know, like the wires aren't all laid out straight. They're all just packed together in three-dimensional three, three volume. And this is another thing that really distinguishes neural hardware in the brain from what we have in silicon is that the circuits are, are, are very are three-dimensional. They fill the th this three-dimensional volume to, to get this rich interconnectivity structure which is something that's very challenging for us to achieve right now in technology uh, because we're mainly limited, for the most part, at least uh, right now with two-dimensional uh, topologies and interconnections. And then finally, uh, if we dive a little dive a level further, if we look at the, where, where two of these processes meet, where an axon, for example, meets a, a dendrite, that's how a signal goes from one neuron to another. And that signal is conveyed by a bunch of vesicles. Those are all these dots here. Uh, I'm sorry, these dots here in the presynaptic neuron, uh, they're vesicles, and when they fuse with the membrane, they dump their contents or neurotransmitter uh, into the intersynaptic space, and that changes the, uh, the channels on the other side, which we can see if we blow up on it. So the point is that the way these, these signals that, uh, go from one neuron, to a, uh, one neuron to another involves this biochemical cascade. Uh, so uh, a chemical is released uh, that's sensed by the receiving cell, it opens a channel, ions flow in, that's one of the main modes. But there are all, also all these very complex molecular me mechanisms uh, where, uh, where, where, where instead of directly opening a channel, which, which admits ions, uh, the, these, the, these receptors uh, initiate uh, another, biochemical, uh, an, another biochemical cascade, which takes place inside the neuron. Okay, and this is things where things get very complicated. And basically, it's a really a molecular machine. When you sort of drill down to it, the stuff that really enables computation and signaling with the brain is all molecules and biochemistry, okay, and molecular, molecular, molecular machinery. And there's a really beautiful book about this, uh, I'll point you to by um, Simon Laughlin and Peter Sterling. Um, it's called Principles of Neural Design. I'm sorry I didn't include it here, but um, Principles of Neural Design by Simon Laughlin and Peter Sterling that sort of really dives into a lot of these details of how information is signaled. But um, anyways, that's, that's my introductory comments. I just kind of wanted to give you there some feeling for um, the mysteries, you know, so we, so I think phenomenologically, we can say the brain uh, builds models of the world. This is what we experience in perception. 
scientifically we're trying to understand you know how exactly does that happen how mechanistically does that happen how do cells work how do neurons work how do they compute how do they process information and uh the the, the deeper you dive into it um the scarier it gets <laughs> and, and you know and but i mean at the same time that's what makes it very exciting and um a big challenge so um so anyways i'll just start, those are my introductory remarks to kind of just maybe um uh, so, yeah, so i had a lot of questions I yeah. have a lot of questions since I organized this, then I have priority over the audience. Yeah, please. <laughs> so let's start with a very high level. Um, I heard you talk probably the first time, it was 10 years ago. Um, uh, over the last four or five years, very high level. Is there something that we discovered about the brain that we didn't know before? What, what would you uh, say that was discovered the last few years and changed the way you think about the brain? Boy, for uh, let me. Oh, we don't have to. No, I'm just going back to the Zoom. I'm sorry, I can't see the Zoom, zoom window. Yeah. Um, the last ten years. Well, the last four or five years, more recently. Yeah, well, five, four. <laughs> uh, that's that's hard. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I can't think of any one thing that's just been revolutionarily changed. Uh, how I think about the brain in, in that amount of time. But I think uh, for, if we can go back 10 years, mm -hmm. I think you know, the discovery of grid cells uh, is really uh, uh, been a transformational discovery in many ways because it, uh, it, it, it basically tells us uh, something about how, brain, how the brain represents the space around us in a way that we didn't really appreciate and understand before. Uh, it also tells us that uh, you, lead, you need a lot of mathematics to understand these representations. So basically these grid cells, they, um, they, they, they represent space by laying out a hexagonal grid around the, the, the space around you to, to form a kind of map of uh, the space around you. And uh, so I think that's been, uh, at least to, in my own mind, kind of really uh, uh, transformational in terms of uh, helping uh, helping us you know, understand more about the nature of these representations. And if you see something like that, so highly structured like that, then we probably know that there's other, other, things, like that, other things like that out there as well. Hmm. Now, you represent the moment that a new tool entered neuroscience, computer science, you know, computational mathematics uh, uh, coupled with neuroscience. Um, is there a new tool that is emerging um, or that uh, is, uh, you can see that will, uh, that will open new uh, horizons to uh, neuroscience. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so, uh, but then that picture that I showed at the beginning, I mean, one of the main tools that people have had is just using um, microelectrodes. And for, for many decades, this is really the only instrument that the field had available was to uh, put a wire into the brain, like literally a single wire, and record from one neuron at a time. And I think that was very limiting. Uh, and uh, so in the past 10, you know, uh, maybe, you know, going back almost 20, but really about best past 10 years, uh, there's been a huge acceleration in the development of uh, technologies available to us to monitor uh, now the activities of large numbers of neurons so you record from thousands of neurons in fact in a genelia farm there's a lab there that can now record from the entire brain of a zebrafish where they can literally see just about every single neuron in the brain simultaneously um, and how how they're activating uh, and this is with uh, with optical imaging so so basically you can use these calcium dyes as such that the uh, the neuron changes the way it reflects light uh, or uh, basically some, some auto fluoresces, it fluoresces its own light uh, in response to voltage changes, or how much calcium is in the cell. And so that's uh, now a direct indicator of activity. And so our ability to monitor um, activity in, in, in neurons has advanced tremendously. Great. Um, yeah. So I know there are projects, one in the United States, I think it's just called Brain, one in Europe, to map the brain. The map you showed looks detailed until you start thinking that there are billions of neurons and trillions of uh, connections. How far are we from mapping the whole brain? 
the whole brain you mean in down to the level of billions of neurons you down know. to the level that makes sense i don't know if it makes sense to go down to the single neuron you know. well <laughs> that's the uh <clears throat> that's a, you know it, it's a question of uh they, what you just the question you just asked the level that makes sense is a huge question right uh a, a huge topic of debate among people too right so um in fact some a lot of people joke that um for any given neuroscientist the level that makes sense is the level that they work at right <laughs> so uh and uh so uh it's really it's really kind of a multi multi-scale or multi-level phenomenon all these things that we're studying right so you can't really confine yourself to any one level but certainly at the level like that box diagram i showed right all those boxes the 30 or so boxes for visual cortex um we now have you know a box diagram of the whole cerebral cortex and uh so there's a guy at uh, i think he was at stanford for a while named nikola markov who has some really nice papers on this where they really kind of now are putting together these wiring diagrams for all the different areas across the cerebral cortex uh but now within each one of those boxes are millions of neurons not billions but you know millions right and so now you want to drill down and uh in an area like v1 you can kind of subdivide it into modules that are called hypercolumns and each of those hypercolumns has about a hundred thousand neurons okay and uh and then we can start to make uh micro circuits of what a small fraction of those columns are doing so let's say on the order of maybe thirty thousand neurons or so and those are called the canonical micro circuits models that people have people are making of those uh and uh but that but now you know going a, a level deeper you want to know something about the signaling mechanisms within those canonical microcircuits uh and there's a, a great diversity of neurotransmitters that are being used uh and that affects how they um, transmit signals and so forth uh and then you go down to levels of molecules like i was showing in that other diagram so it um Get, you know getting down to that, that so i'd say you know under having a map of the brain at the, at the level of those millions of neurons and so forth is something that still does not exist that's one of the goals of uh, so-called connectomics um so in connectomics uh what people are doing is taking those three-dimensional cross sections for example like i showed of the uh of the electron microscope image right a cross section of all that tissue so you take many of these uh very finely sliced uh cross sections of the three dimensional tissue and you try to reconstruct try to reconstruct all the wires in that tissue and how those how those neurons are interconnecting and then you can start to pull out these di these wiring diagrams of, of micro circuits and uh so the uh the allen institute in seattle is one of the places where they're doing that uh and uh and howard hughes medical institute and other other places and, and one of the places i think where it's made a lot of progress actually is in the fly brain okay because like if you if you try you say well you know a lot of people pose it like okay we're going to make this big connectomics map of the entire human brain uh you know it doesn't even make it's not clear if that would even make sense of a thing to do right because it's, mm. it's we're, we're as a field we're not prepared to handle all that data but if you can take yourself to something like a fly brain where you can maybe have much more focused and well-placed questions about what dif what different modules in the fly brain are doing now if you have the connectomic circuit for that module you you you've really sort of uh targeted your your data gathering in a, in a much more productive way okay now i know that you are studying the brain of insects and spiders is that why or is there another reason what are you finding in uh in spiders well, and, uh, and, and in insects lots of lots of different reasons i mean uh so uh i, I guess you know maybe let's see if, if you want to understand intelligence then you really have to understand the origins of intelligence and uh intelligence didn't just appear on the on the scene one day with humans right it's not like we had perception all of a sudden bam you know that came from something and i think it came from animals you know way back in the evolutionary evolutionary chain long before humans came on the scene um and in fact in fact insects right uh, insects have a lot of the 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 uh, uh the behaviors that suggests that they build internal models of the world and now as we probe their brains we start to see that they're actually in building internal models of the world so this is for example again at Janelia Gen farm uh Vivek uh, I'm sorry um uh 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 I'm blanking on his first name Jayaraman Jayaraman is his last name uh 
he, uh, in his lab, they discovered these head direction cells in the fly, in the fruit fly, uh, and the circuit that actually enables them to compute head direction. But basically, these head direction cells are signaling what direction the fly is going in the external world. Okay, it's almost like an internal, like a, like a, like a compass, internal representation, uh, like, a, like a compass of where it's heading in the world. And it's not built out of magnetic sense. It basically builds this through accumulating many different sensory cues, uh, its own motor actions, the visual landmarks out there in the world and so forth, but it's building this stable representation internally of how it's heading, um, how it's heading in the world. So I think that's what, um, you know, I think that that's it, it, what it tells us is that there's certain kind of core problems that need to be solved there. And one is just, you know, interacting with the world, how you take sensory information, how you build models out of sensory information and how you use that to guide action. And insects have mastered these core problems, right? So you don't have to go to humans or even rats to understand how those core problems are being solved. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, from these other organisms, there's, there's a lot to begin. And, and insects, I mean, for, as, as somebody who knows nothing about insects, I notice, I, I think there's a big difference between the intelligence of an ant that can create these amazing societies and the intelligence of a fly. Maybe I'm wrong, but, you know. Uh, so how big are these brains, how complex they are to study? And, and is it the same thing to study the, the brain of a fly, brain of an ant? Uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, I'd put them all on the same, <laughs> about the same playing field. Uh, roughly about a million neurons is, is where you're at, you know, with a fly or a bee or a, or a spider or something like that. It's on the order, you know, it's the sort of order of magnitude. Um, estimate of where, where, like, typically about a million neurons, I think. Hmm. But they do different things, right? An ant does not, the, the life of an ant and the purpose of its actions is not the same as the life of a fly. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's a totally different behaviors and um, repertoires and, and things like that, um, what, what, what they're doing. And, and um, but, uh, but if you just, you know, let's, if you think about what the fly has to do, it has a visual system. It has a, it has a compound eye that has about, uh, about a thousand amatidia or little, little tiny lenses looking out there at the world. Uh, so it's equivalent of about maybe a 30 by 30 pixel image of the world, okay? And it has to take all these uh, pixels that it's gathering as it flies through the world, right? They're sort of twinkling on and off in a very complicated way and figure out from that, okay, uh, where am I going, you know, and what's out there, right? And it has to put that together with what it's smelling, what it's sensing through other modalities to figure out where's the food, um, where, where's, where's my mate, or how do I, where I find a mate, <laughs> and things like that. And all that stuff out there that the fly has to interact with, it's in three-dimensional space, mm -hmm. right? And these animals can't survive by just kind of hunting and pecking and randomly saying, like, is it there, is it there, is it there? No, they have to remember, like the bee remembers okay, I got some pollen from over there, right? That pollen I got that, that, I get, that lives at some three-dimensional location in the world, I'm going to go back to my hive and tell my buddies where that is in three-dimensional space. Okay, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And somehow these, these neural systems have the capacity to do that. Okay, talking for, of intelligence, <clears throat> uh, what's your opinion about the state of artificial intelligence? Um, I know, and you, you were in the field uh, even before it was called deep learning. You wrote a paper, what was it, 20 years ago now, sparse, sparse coding, right? Which is still uh, cited everywhere. So what's, uh, what's your feeling? I mean, Elon Musk just told us that uh, <clears throat> fully autonomous cars are uh, around the corner. Yeah. Uh, can, can I put up a slide? I just have one slide, I promise. <laughs> what's that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I just, uh, I, uh, I have one, one slide which I, I think will uh, convey my opinion about that. Um, so, uh, so, so these are three very wise people from uh, more than half a century ago who, uh, you know, you can sort of see, see what they're saying here. These are probably some of three of the smartest people, you know, involved in computing <clears throat> technology in the 1960s. Uh, but they all thought that intelligence, building artificial intelligence was just around the corner. 
And uh, this is what we're also saying today. A lot of people you know, are making similar kinds of claims and also very smart people are saying similar things. And I think 50 years from now, we'll have pictures of them <laughs> with these quotes of what they're saying, and we still won't be there. Uh, that's my guess. I mean, because who knows? I mean, I, I guess my, my point is that, you know, to, to get there, well, I think there's a couple points here. One is that, one is that I think there is, it's kind of psychologically interesting to look at what's going on here is that we are consistently, we have consistently underestimated the magnitude of the problem of what intelligence is, right? So I think one thing is we just aren't even asking the right question, asking the right question. Uh, not only what is it, what is, our, what is intelligence, but you know, what kind of machinery need, do you need to, to build it uh, and, and, and so forth. So just kind of understanding the magnitude, appreciating the magnitude of problem is something we've been very, very poor at. We have very, very poor intuitions about, uh, introspections about, um, about you know, the problems that need to be solved. Uh, uh, so that's one. And, and I think the other is, you know, who, who knows? I mean, it, it, it could happen, but it's going to take it's going to take some kind of a, uh, a breakthrough, right? And so far, we've, we've not had that breakthrough. Uh, if you, you know, if you look, go back 20 years, there's been no breakthrough between like 20 years ago and what happened, what, where we are right now, right now. Some people cite deep learning. I, that's not a breakthrough, okay? Uh, and, uh, but uh, there has to be some kind of a, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a paradigm shift in how we, how we think about and understand uh, the problem that hasn't happened. So who knows? And, and the nature of breakthroughs is very hard to predict, right? It could happen. Uh, the breakthrough could happen tomorrow. Uh, the breakthrough could um, uh, breakthrough could happen, you know, 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but it's going to take something, you know, I think some something like that to 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 achieve what people are today saying that we, you know, some self-driving cars, for example, to do that it really requires building models of the world and being able to reason about the world. And uh, this is something that animals have mastered and we just don't quite understand, you know, what the, what the important problems are to be solved. I think we know some of them, but, but it's but still a long, long ways ahead of us. What about, what about uh, uh, brain computer interfaces? That, that, I mean, there seems to be more real progress there. I mean, we see paralyzed people who start to Absolutely. objects. No, I think that's one of the, been, uh, the big, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, one of the big revolutions with, within, within neuroscience in terms of like a societally relevant breakthrough uh, that could change lives is this ability to, uh, to now, you know, record from activity from neurons in the brain and convert that into the actions of some kind of a prosthetic device um, that potentially, you know, enab enables paralyzed people to um, to to uh, to interact with the world. Um, mm. So that's that's huge, and I, and I think that's going to continue to advance. And machine learning will be a big part of that, you know, uh, that that enterprise algorithms. Um, <clears throat> we hear a lot about. Uh... Uh, diet, exercise, uh, to keep a healthy body. Is there something the neuroscientists can tell us about how to keep our brain in good shape, prevent uh, neurological disor uh, disorders, uh, slow down the decay of memory and so on? The, yeah, <laughs> so this one is going outside my, my area of expertise, but um, you know, there's a lot of people who study this. Uh, in particular, one of them is uh, Bruce McEwen, who is at the Rockefeller University. Um, and uh, but uh, but people, you know, have, have are beginning to understand the the relationship between exercise uh, and the brain. For example, exercise promotes neurogenesis uh, in the hipp hippocampus, and so uh, so there's a lot of lot of links there um, that I think are starting to get discovered. Uh, but um, so I think, yeah, it's an active area of study, but I'm not the person to, uh, <laughs> I can only just kind of speculate about it, I think. Yeah. Is there something you do to keep your brain in good shape? I exercise. Okay. Yeah. I do that. Okay. Um, so back to the complexity of the brain. <clears throat> and I read books. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm sorry, I go know, ahead. Uh, back to the complexity of the brain. And I know some of these questions don't have answers, but... Uh, uh, also, also to let people know uh, 
this, uh, these facts. So um, the brain uses a number of neurotransmitters. I don't remember how many, 50, 60, 70, whatever. So it's, it sounds like it's different networks that coexist and the neurons, there are different kinds of neurons. I don't know if you can tell us something about the different types. And correct me if I'm wrong, but if I pick two neurons and look at them in the microscope, they're not identical. I mean, artificial intelligence uses neurons that are all identical. So the, 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 the complexity of the human brain, just in terms of the, of the constituents, is, is just, you know, colossal. Yes. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, can you comment on this? I mean, the neurotransmitters, the different kind of neurons. Oh, I, I, I mean, again, I, I, this is a, I'm probably not the best person. I can just tell you it's extremely rich, you know, in terms of the, the, the number of neurotransmitters that are, different neurotransmitters that are used, the different cell types, uh, different morphologies. It's not just one type of neuron. Uh, one of the, you know, the biggest subdivisions is excitatory versus inhibitory. Right, so the neurons that uh, that in, that uh, if you want to inhibit another neuron, you you have to have an in, uh, inhibitory interneuron to do that. They're not just done by that. You can't just sort of have, have arbitrary assign the synapses, or like in the neural networks that we build, the synapses can be arbitrarily positive or ne negative typically. So if you want to have a negative synapse, you have to build a different neuron for that. Um, there's probably reasons for doing that. Uh, but um, but uh, so so understanding how this diversity of cell types uh, helps us in terms of computation, uh, how this diversity of neurotransmitters helps us in computation. I think that's uh, what's not quite yet clear. I don't think we have a really uh, super good understanding of that. But um, I think that I think we will. I think that's one of the areas you know maybe in the next decade or so that we'll start to really develop a better appreciation of. <laughs> okay yeah yeah on that note thank you for joining us for this webinar thank you bruno thank for this, you for having uh, me it's interesting discussion um uh thank you audience uh check out lasertalks.com for the program in, uh, in august with some some more very interesting dialogues thank you very much bruno okay thank you thank you bye so long